Hello everyone, welcome back. So you're back here, and I am going to be doing another educational video, uh, like I do every month. <laughs> so, last time we were doing some ones about the marine ecosystems like that, I think we did whale falls last time. Uh, this time, it's not going to be an ecosystem, it's going to be something that animals do kind of around the world, at least in like northern, southern, like colder areas. But, it is hibernation. Right now, where I'm at living, <laughs> it is getting pretty cold out and animals are just starting to go into their humble abodes and try to survive out the cold winter weather. So I thought this would be a perfect time to do this one. So first off, kind of like we do every time, what is hibernation? So it, you might think, oh, I know what hibernation is. Animals just go to sleep until it warms up. And I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, it's not, but that you don't know like why they're going to sleep or what they're actually doing because they're asleep. So hibernation, it's a state of minimal activity and metabolic depression. So minimal activity, sleeping is I would consider minimal activity, you're doing nothing. And metabolic depression is just, they are not using as much energy, they're not needing as much food or anything like that because they're not moving around. So, it is characterized by low body temperature, slow breathing, slow heart rate, and then low metabolic rate. And it mostly occurs during winter months, but there are animals that will just go through it whenever there's no food or whatnot. So, I mean, it's not always during winter months, but it most of the time is. So, why do animals go in hibernation? Well. The short answer is, is to conserve energy. And that's mostly because in the winter, okay, if you're a carnivore, most of the animals that you are going to be eating or whatnot are also asleep. And if you're a herbivore, the reason why you're going to be uh, going into hibernation is because all the plants are dead because it's winter and snow and frost and whatnot cold. Plants can't live in that. So... There is no food for you to eat, so you're like, hey, I'll just go to sleep. <laughs> That's the short, sweet answer of it. But to really go like a little bit more in depth, uh, because of metabolism. So metabolism is a set of life-sustaining chemical reactions in an organism. And one of those being aerobic cellular respiration. Aerobic, meaning it needs oxygen to go through, and cellular respiration is basically when a cell will break down like food as in chemical energy into like energy you can use like ATP and stuff like that. So pretty cool. Uh, here is a short sweet chemical reaction, which there is much more that goes into this. Like I could go through the Krebs cycle and uh, electron, electron transport chain, but we're not going to do that here. That's a little too in depth. So pretty much, this is a short and sweet chemical reaction. So we have glucose, which is the C6H12O6. And then you also take oxygen and you use that to turn it into CO2, which is just the carbon dioxide you're breathing out. You also get some water out of it. And then you get 38 ATP things, which that's after you go through the Krebs cycle electron, electron transport chain. But like I said, we're not going through that. So the food you eat and oxygen break down into energy. That's basically all we need to know and a little bit of water. So how long does hibernation last? Uh, it very, very much depends on a lot of different things. <laughs> but short and sweet, days, weeks, months, who knows? It could, t usually months, okay? Because it, usually it takes a couple months for winter to warm up and stuff like that. Or winter to end, I guess. But some animals could just go in for days or weeks at a time. Doesn't really matter. Or I guess it does matter. It just kind of depends. And it mostly depends on, first off, what species it is. Because bears and ground squirrels and stuff like that will go at many different times. And different lengths of time. Uh, it deals a lot with ambient temperature because that's when it gets cold out. It's like that. Not enough food around. The time of year. And then also an animal's body condition. 
And that's why I have two pictures here. So I have one picture on the left here. And that bear is very, very, uh, very thick. <laughs> very big. And it's got a lot of fat on it. And that animal will be able to stay in hibernation for much, much longer than, let's say, the animal on the right. The animal on the right is very skinny, very thin, and if it went into hibernation, it would not be able to stay in for very long at all. So that is what I mean by body condition. <laughs> okay, so getting ready for hibernation. So whenever an animal... Like goes into hibernation, it needs a lot of food. That's why in the last picture, the one on the left was kind of fat and stuff like that. It's ready for hibernation. So the animal needs to store enough energy or fat or whatnot to last through the duration of hibernation. And in larger species, they will become hy hyperphagic and they will have a strong sensation of hunger and a desire to eat upon leading to overeating. So they'll just eat, 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 and they'll end up overeating, and they'll become very fat. And yeah, that's basically it. They'll just eat large amounts of food to fatten up. And the one you can think about on this one is mostly, I think, of the bear. And then there's smaller species. But smaller species don't really go through the same thing as like the bears do, because they don't just sit there and eat, eat, eat. They'll eat a little bit, yeah, of course. But they will create food caches. And they will store the food to eat. So here, right behind me, I have a picture of a grill. A gas grill, it looks like, yes. And it is full of nuts. <laughs> and this is where squirrels and stuff like that, rodents, will keep their food. Anywhere they think is safe. So, in the like winter time, whatever, if you have like some something that they can get inside of that they think is like a safe place to hold their food and stuff like that, you might wake like, sorry, not wake up, but you might start it up in the summer, like, or like spring, whenever you, like, it gets warming up, and you open it up, and holy crap, you got a lot of nuts here. <laughs> and that's just the squirrels and rodents possibly did not need all those, or they could have forgot they put them there. I think I've heard that before. And yeah, they'll just store the food away, and then when it's winter, they'll still go out and g gather up some of the food, go eat a little bit, and then go back to sleep. So, I mean, that seems like a much better way to kind of go about it than just going to sleep for a long time and overeating. At least to me it does. Now, so I was saying the black bears are probably the ones that most people, or at least I think of the most whenever I think of like hibernation. So let's talk about the American black bear. So American black bears will enter their dens around October, November when it's starting to cool off or starting to get cooler. And southernmost areas, like if you go down Georgia, Tennessee, that area around there, uh, only pregnant females will go into hibernation because they'll go there to have their cubs. And most other ones won't. Uh, their dens are usually uh, tree cavities, or they could be underneath logs or rocks in the banks of, like, like rivers, I think? Yeah. Uh, caves or culverts, and those are just different places they could stay. I usually think of caves, but... Uh, they will put on around 14 kilograms or 30 pounds of body fat to get them through the several months of hibernation. And American black bears will usually go for between three to eight months. So, like, the farther south you are in America, it'll be a shorter time. And the further north you are, it'll be a longer time. And during that time, they live off the stored fat that they gain before hibernation. Now, a bear's heart rate drops from 40 to 50, which is their normal heartbeat, to about eight beats per minute. That is insanely low. <laughs> so 40 to 50 beats per minute to 8 beats. Now, that is compared to the human's uh, beats per minute, which is 60 to 100. We have a quite a bit faster heart than they do. At the higher limit. Then, their metabolic rate. They can drop their metabolic rate to about a quarter of what its non-hibernating, or the basal, metabolic rate is. So, they can use... 
they'll use like a quarter of the amount of like body fat or food during hi hibernation. They'll use a quarter of it. And then also something that I learned from this that is like kind of like interesting, I guess, or kind of weird. But uh, let me move myself over a little bit. I'm just slightly, slightly in the way. There we go. So, anyways, they will retain all their extra, <laughs> all their waste, okay, excretory waste, all their like, think of feces and stuff like that, and they will develop a hardened mask mass of fecal material and the colon, and that is known as a fecal plug. So basically, all their poop just condenses down into a plug that they'll get rid of later inside, like whenever it warms up. <laughs> That was kind of like an interesting thing I learned about that I didn't really think about. I kind of thought they still would kind of go to the go to the bathroom. <laughs> but they also will recycle their proteins and urine and stuff. This allows them to stop urinating for months at a time and avoid muscle atrophy. And again, I have a picture here of baby black bears because they're very cute. <laughs> And, again, I have on here that the mothers will go into hibernation in the winter months to give birth to their offspring. So, there are, like, two types of hibernation, like, if you want to divide it up. One of them being obligate hibernation, which they will, like, spontaneously and sometimes annually enter hibernation regardless of temperature or food availability. So, even... If it's like warm out and they have plenty of food and everything like that, they will still sometimes go into hibernation. And that can be for many different reasons. We're not going to look into them right now. But they will just always go into hibernation at some point in the year. And then these are going to be like ground squirrels, rodents, European hedgehogs, stuff like that. Then there is facultative hibernation. And then these will enter hibernation only when it is cold or food deprived. So these are what you think of whenever you go to like black bears and stuff like that. Because when it gets cold and there's not enough food, they'll just go into hibernation. And these facultative hibernators are something like uh, black trailed prairie dogs and then Easter, Eastern chipmunks. Oh my. And I got some pictures here of the European hedgehog for obligate. And then facultative, I have the black tailed prairie dog there. You can tell because of the black tail. <laughs> now, so we are going to look at the Arctic ground squirrels, which I think I had... Yes, they are the obligate hibernators. But since they are in the Arctic or whatever, they do go to sleep during the winters kind of thing. Um, anyways, so... These arctic ground squirrels uh, in Alaska are referred to as parka squirrels, and that is because their pelts are good for parkas and clothing. They're nice and warm. And fluffy. <laughs> uh, they will undergo a coat change going from yet red and yellow in the summer to a silvery in the fall to help with um, camouflage in this like snow and whatnot. So, hibernation is different between males and females for these species. The males will go in late September to early April. Females will go in the early August to late April. So females will go much earlier than the males. Males will go much later. Then let's move myself over again so we can see the rest of this. Okay, body temperature of these Arctic ground squirrels can like fluctuate very, very high. <laughs> or very low, I guess. Uh, these body temperatures can go from their regular, which is 37 degrees Celsius, or 99 degrees Fahrenheit, which is kind of high, uh, to as little as negative 3 degrees Celsius, or 27 degrees Fahrenheit for my American viewers. <laughs> and that is extremely cold. That's below freezing. I say 0 degrees Celsius would be uh, freezing temperature in Celsius. 32 degrees Fahrenheit for American viewers. Their heart rate also their heart rate, sorry, drops to about one beat per minute. Whereas bear the black bears were eight beats per minute. So then also, whenever they go into hibernation, 
the brain connections or the neurons and stuff like that in their brains will sometimes wither away but whenever they start to wake up they will regrow while they're waking up which is pretty cool actually uh the best theory of why squirrel's blood doesn't freeze when they go that low is because the animal is able to cleanse their bodies of ice nucleators, which if you don't know, ice nucleators are basically the tiny particles of either food, dust, bacteria that ice crystals will bond to, to create ice crystals. So if there's no, none of these food, dust or bacteria, or there's very few of them, not many or no ice crystals will start to form. And this is, yeah, they're, they're necessary for ice crystals. And something that's kind of cool is whenever you think of like snow machines and stuff like that, like uh, I don't know for sure where they use them, probably like ski resorts and stuff like that. Whenever they use those snow machines, usually they spray a bacteria. I don't know what type of bacteria it is off the top of my head, but usually they'll spray the bacteria for the ice crystals to form on. So, don't think about it too much whenever you see a snow machine. Just don't think about it. <laughs> okay, so that is hibernation. But there are other animals that go through kind of a type of hibernation. In reptiles, it's called brumation. And this also happens during, like, the cold temperature winter months. And it's a period of dormancy similar to hibernation in mammals. Ectothermic... Uh, animals have no system to deal with the cold temperatures because they rely on like their outside environment to warm themselves up. That's why you see snakes and reptiles needing sun. So reptiles that are dormant in the winter have higher survival rates and slower aging. So whenever they go dormant in the winter, they are more likely to survive and survive longer. Uh, then hyper capnic acidosis hypercapnic capnic acidosis yes is a buildup of carbon dioxide in the blood and this will slow metabolism and then it'll interfere with the oxygen transport so the oxygen is not used up and can still reach the tissues so this is just a reptile's way of like they'll build up a lot of carbon in their blood and that will cause their metabolism to slow, kind of like what other animals would do to slow their metabolism. And the animals that do this are some bearded dragons, some turtles, and snakes. And I have a picture here right behind me that is of an alligator snout. Now, something I learned fairly, like, eh, maybe last year, or maybe before that, I don't know, sometime, is that alligators, especially in areas now that like climate change is like that, some areas that are freezing, uh, that did not freeze, are freezing now, and they have been seeing alligators have been sticking their snouts up through the ice and staying like that so they can get oxygen and they can survive in the frozen waters, or the tops frozen. I guess the bottom's not frozen, but anyways, that's a very cool like, I guess it's an adaptation or something like that. I don't know. It's some cool way that they have survived, and it is very cool. But now we're going to look at another reptile that I think is even cooler. Now, it's not just painted turtles, but these this is the one that I chose to do for it. But turtles in general are pretty good hibernators. So, uh, painted turtles here hibernate by burying itself in either the bottom of a body of water, like in the mud, or near the near water in the shore bank and this is because underwater temperatures are more stable that's why like fish and stuff like that can still survive underneath the water because the ice on the surface will insulate the water and cause the surface to freeze but below it will stay warmer uh hopefully that's understood <laughs> but anyways their body temperature averages about 6 degrees Celsius or 43 degrees Fahrenheit. And warm weather, weather will bring the turtles out of hibernation. These turtles can survive hypoxic. Oh my gosh, I, I had a brain fart. So they can survive hypoxic low oxygen or anoxic, which is no oxygen, environments. And you may think, how can a turtle or anything survive in an area with no oxygen? 
Well, we'll get to that. <laughs> so, in, like, whenever they are underneath the ice, the turtles can get, go internal, uh, yes, internal with an E, respiration, or they can go through cloacal respiration, which is breathing through their butts. So they can either absorb oxygen through their skin, because it's kind of more uh, thin, or they can breathe through their butts. That is pretty cool, actually. <laughs> And they can also go through anaerobic respiration, respiration without oxygen. So whenever we went to the metabolism slide, which I think are like the second slide, something like that, I showed you that you could use glucose and oxygen to make energy, which is like 38 ATP. This is going to be using up glucose without oxygen, but there is a downside to this. So I'll, let's look at the equation here on the bottom, okay? This equation, breaks down glucose, and you will end up getting two ATP, but you also get lactic acid, which lactic acid, whenever it builds up in you, it's what causes your muscles to hurt. So whenever you're working out and stuff like that, if you're not breathing enough, that's what causes your muscles to hurt. You're just building up a lot of lactic acid. So that's why you have to breathe a lot more. So these turtles, if they have no oxygen, they will build up a ton of lactic acid inside their body. But they have a way to get around this. So the turtle shell is made of carbonate, okay? And carbonate is used as a buffer to counteract the lactic acid. So they'll their shell will weaken a little bit, but that makes it so they can survive underwater without oxygen. So it's a very cool, very cool thing that they can do. And this causes Western painted turtle shells to survive they can survive 170 days and with no oxygen and that is insanely long insanely long i, I could not even imagine like you, you couldn't you couldn't <laughs> you couldn't survive underwater with, like a day without oxygen at all so it's very very cool of them that they can use their shell or i think they can kind of use some of the car uh calcium in their bones i think also to counteract the lactic acid but yeah just breathe guys just breathe <laughs> Okay, so also we have diapause, which is in arthropods. So diapause is, or seasonal diapause, I guess, is the winter dormancy for arthropods. And arthropods, uh, particularly variable in time in and extent. So they're currently evolving as a response to climate change. So the time that they go into dormancy and how long they stay in is changing. It is quickly evolving with large genetic variation and it has strong effects on natural selection, which natural selection is just the best adapted to the environment survives and leads to passing on their genetics to the next, their children. So the ones that can survive the winters and stuff like that are the ones that are going to be having more babies the next season. So it has evolved many times across many different clades of arthropods. So it's not just like one species created it. It's just that tons of other species have done it also. And it is thought to have originally evolved in three stages. These three, three stages are the development of neuro endocrine uh, endocrine control over bodily functions then also the metabolic rates decreasing in response to colder temperatures then the rev rev uh, reliable seasonal indicators within the arthropod like biological timers so yeah <laughs> that is a lot to say and a lot of words in my mouth so, we have one arthropod here, one insect, I guess, that we are going to be looking at. And it is the Arctic woolly bear moth. And I have some pictures here. I have a picture of it as a caterpillar. And then behind my head here, I have a picture of it in a cocoon. Then I also have a picture of the actual moths. So, these, uh, or caterpillars or moths or whatever, are native to the high Arctic, Greenland, Russia area, stuff like that. And the full caterpillar's life cycle may extend up to seven years. So sometimes it can last seven years before they even, like, die. So from caterpillar to cocoon to moth, sometimes seven years. 
Uh, they can withstand temperatures as low as negative 70 degrees Celsius. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that is negative uh, 94 degrees Fahrenheit. Much, much, much lower than freezing temperature. And, I mean, they have to because since they're in the high Arctic Greenland, Russia area. And they will go through winter diapause. And that inside their cocoon or the hyperneculum. Neculum? Yes. So, just think of it as a cocoon. And this protects it from parasitoids or stuff that's going to try to kill it. And also the degradation of the mitochondria, which is linked to a decreased metabolism or hypometabolism. So degradation of mitochondria is basically the mitochondria just kind of like that don't work as good or maybe dying or stuff like that. This causes their metabolism to drop so low it almost stops entirely. So they're almost completely dead. And then it'll fully restore in the spring after mere hours of resuming activity. They also have antifreeze production, which will keep their blood from freezing and stuff like that, which their metabolism is barely working at that. Um, their cocoon takes 24 hours to create, and they'll orient themselves toward the sun or the solar radiation so that they can accumulate heat because they, their metabolism is not building up enough heat. And a large percentage of larvae will also spin joint cocoons with each other. So it is pretty normal for two of these uh, moths or caterpillars to spin a cocoon connected to each other, which is kind of cool, kind of cool. Sometimes there are even more of them. Then we've talked about insects. We've talked about reptiles. Let's think about uh, our nice fish friends. <laughs> so, fish. Uh, as I said before, with like the turtles like that, uh, in ox like the the water does not freeze completely. Only the surface of the water will freeze, and then below it will be a more stable uh, temperature. But there's a problem with the ice. The ice causes it to not get enough oxygen into the water. And also, plants are not growing, so they're not putting any oxygen in the water. So that's the reason why they become anoxic. So, in oxygen water, oxygenated, oxygenated water, fish will be inactive. They'll just like swim, like they'll barely swim around, just stay kind of still. Also, colder temperatures will decrease their energy consumption because they're not moving or anything like that. And then their metabolic rate will not really change that much because they have oxygen, so they can still use up their stuff. It's fine. They'll still move. They'll still possibly try to eat things, but they will not move fast. Uh, hy hypoxic conditions where there's no oxygen, they have to suppress their metabolism because they have to have oxygen to go through aerobic respiration, cellular respiration. So, most fish that are dormant in the winter save energy by being still. Now, I don't have an actual, like, specific example of this because a lot of fish do this. Just a lot. I could throw about any fish on there that you know is in, like, a northern, like, climate or something like that. Like, bass, bluegill, like, stuff like that. I mean, any of them do either, usually the oxygenated water, like, they just stay inactive kind of thing. But I didn't want to just throw one random one. I was trying to find one specif specifically, but I couldn't find one. But there is one other, like, animal species that we have not looked at that I think we should. Humans. <laughs> this is very, very, like, pseudoscience, speculative kind of stuff like that, that, like, could possibly happen in the, like, distant future. But so far is not an option. So this is cryo-hibernation. Now, have any of you played Halo? Or watched any sci-fi show in the world, basically? Any sci-fi show where they have to travel super far, super long distances in, like, a human lifespan? It's impossible to do in a human lifespan. They, I, they've talked about generational ships where quite literally generations of people go through before they even reach a destination. But this is one that they've kind of thought of to kind of counteract that where it's called cryosleep, I guess you could consider it, and you preserve a human in a suspended state 
under extremely frigid conditions, which this doesn't have to be human. It could be any animal, really, but this is what they're trying for humans. Uh, it is cryonics, which is a procedure that can begin only after a patient is clinically and legally dead. So usually whenever people go into uh, cryo sleep or whatnot, like there's people that have been put into cryo animation, whatever. And it only happens when they're dead because it's illegal to put someone that is alive through this for good reasons. And it's one of those things where like they'll usually die from like natural processes. Like usually it's like kind of older people or someone that has some medical condition. So right whenever they go dead, like their heart stops, they will instantly start doing these procedures to uh, save as much body tissue as you can. Because right when a person dies, it's a ticking clock that stuff starts breaking you down, like mostly the bacteria in your body. So one of the things that they will do is they will put an antifreeze agent on your body or in your body, which uh, replaces the water in your cells. So, whenever a cell, if it has water in it, if a cell freezes, the, se the water will crystallize and expand, which causes the cell to burst. But this antifreeze will, uh, agent will freeze, but it won't cause the cell to burst. That's as easy as it is. And they will also flash freeze the tissue in your body, so like brain, organs, everything, which is uh, vitrification. And that will put your body at about negative uh, 140 degrees Celsius or negative 220 degrees Fahrenheit. That's why you flash freeze. Because the faster you freeze, the... Uh, let me see. The best way to put it is the faster you freeze, the less formation of ice crystals. The slower you freeze, the more ice crystals could be. So instead of crystallizing into ice... The chemicals that are the antifreeze chemicals will clump together and become solid, kind of like a sheet of glass. So, like a nice, clean freeze. Now, uh, the antifreeze agent, I have a picture in the bottom left-hand corner there. That is the, uh, the antifreeze agent that they use in Halo. It's kind of like a milky substance or whatnot. Uh, and then I have the cryo chamber in the top right-hand corner that they use in Halo. <laughs> but really, there's lots of different ones. Some of them have liquids inside of them. Some of them actually do not. They just have air. Either way, your body is frozen. Uh, revival is the biggest, biggest problem with this thing. Because if they froze you completely, no body tissue damage, anything like that, you still have to be revived. And that's... It, it, it's not working. <laughs> so, the things you have to go through to be revived... First, repairing the damage from the lack of oxygen. That's like brain, all your cells out of oxygen, everything like that. You have to repair that. Also, the cryoprotectant is probably toxic. So you have to repair the toxicity that, like whatever the cryoprotectant did to your cells, you have to counteract that. Then also thermal stress, a fracturing. So whenever you heat up the body, we do not want the body to start cracking <laughs> and fracturing and stuff. Then also freezing in the tissues that do not successfully vitrify. So what if some of the tissues did not freeze? If they did not freeze, then they are not protected. <laughs> so whenever you finally did get revived, some of your organs or tissue might be dead. Those are some of the big problems with cryohibernation or cryosleep. And you also had to reverse the cause of death. So, what I said what before was, like, you cannot be put into this when you're alive. You have to be legally dead. Usually, it's someone that it has some sort of incurable disease. And, like, think of cancer or something like that. Or anything else. Like, anything that we cannot cure right now. A lot of people want to go into cryohibernation because later on in the future, there might be a cure to this. So, whenever these people die for whatever reason, reason it is, then sometimes people also die of old age, whatnot. But they also have to reverse whatever caused them to die. You can't just like, oh, you're back like we unthawed you, you're back to life, you'll you'll survive now. They have to actually fix whatever the reason was that you died. 
And that is why, like, we cannot, we cannot fix someone that is frozen yet. We cannot do that. That's why the revival technology is very speculative and does not currently exist. But this would be something amazing for space travel. Because space travel, whenever you go up to space, you have to bring all the food, water, everything, oxygen, to keep people alive for however long the trip's going to be. If you could put these people into cryosleep, they won't be using oxygen. Or, yeah, they won't be using oxygen at all. They won't be eating, they won't be drinking, they won't be doing anything like that. You'll just be using electricity to keep them frozen. That's basically the main thing you'll be doing. So, trips like to... If you want to go to a distant star or something like that, you would have to have something like this. Be, or do a generational ship, and you'd have like hundreds of generations of people just to get to that place. Which I don't think is the right way to do it. But, that is about all I have to say about hibernation. Um... There is also, uh, some animals go t through torpor, which is basically uh, times where they won't, will be less active and so like that. Like birds, I think, go through it and some reptiles and also. There wasn't enough I had to say about it to add it in here, but I thought I'd mention it. Um, but yeah, uh, hopefully you enjoy it. This is a little different than what I did for the other last two. So I hope you guys still enjoyed it. This isn't really an ecosystem or anything like that. It's just something animals do, which I still got to talk about uh, quite a few animals. I got to talk about the black bear. I got to talk about the Arctic ground squirrel. I got to talk about the Arctic moth. Painted turtle. Yeah. So, I mean, I still got to talk about quite a few animals. So I, I do like that. And we also got to talk about some sci-fi stuff here at the very end, even though it is highly speculative and who knows if we can actually do it. And we're probably not going to be able to do it in my lifetime. But yeah, uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed. Uh, I I have not decided what I'm going to do for the next one yet. I will start working on it after this one and I get done with this. But yeah. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, I will see you guys in the next educational video. So, bye!